My name is Jana Aranda. I'm the president of Engineering for Change. And I am I'm so pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar uh, with our incredible panel comprised of uh, Henry Louis, uh, Derek Terry, and Mohammed Baum, who will be uh, giving us some insights on their work uh, applying data-driven design for off-grid systems and specifically looking at the case study of delivering uh, electricity on the Navajo Nation here in the United States. Um, so for those of you who are joining us for the very first time today, um, I want to tell you a little bit about our organization, Engineering for Change, or E4C for short, is a nonprofit organization founded jointly by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, as well as other engineering associations to prepare, educate, and activate the international technical workforce uh, to advance uh, quality of life and ensure that we benefit people and planet. At E4C, we provide upskilling and professional development opportunities at the intersection of engineering and sustainable development for our global community and particularly early career technical professionals through programs such as our Engineering for Change Fellowship. And we support mission aligned organizations to achieve their sustainability objectives through our impact projects and services. There are more than 54,000 Engineering for Change members worldwide and a global audience of over 1 million people that believe engineering can change the world. I'm sure that you all count yourselves among that community. Of course, for more information about E4C, our programs, and every opportunity that is available to you as members, I encourage you to visit uh, our website. The link should be in the chat shortly. And of course, invite you to visit us, uh, follow us on our social media channels. So uh, I know that many of you since COVID are probably experts in Zoom and likely don't need this, but for those of you who are maybe joining us for the first time, um, I would like to in, uh, make sure that we are getting familiar with uh, the really critical functions, including chat. So at this time, I would like to invite you to please into the chat window, enter your location. Where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you today from Brooklyn, New York. I uh, would love to see where you're joining us from today. If you don't see your chat window, just go to the bottom of your screen and type on the little icon. So we see folks from Ecuador and Somalia, Pakistan and Uganda, um, Seattle and Manchester, Nairobi, Jakarta. I don't know that flag. Oh, who put the flag and help me out here? Malawi and Amsterdam. Welcome, welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you from Yemen to Canada. Uh, thrilled to welcome you today to our webinar. Um, again, if the chat is not open on your screen, look for the chat icon on the bottom in the middle of the slides. And um, second, if you have any questions during the webinar, we encourage you to please use the Q&A button in order to enter your questions so we can keep track of them for our presenters. Uh, do not just enter them into the chat. However, you are, of course, welcome to uh, converse with your fellow uh, webinar uh, participants in that chat window or share any tips or any reflections. Um, so if you're following us on Twitter today, uh, please do follow, uh, join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinar series. So uh, again, really pleased to see the global representation today on, uh, on here. I see, uh, Slovenia and New Mexico and Nigeria and Sweden. And this is the, I have not seen people enter their flag icons and it's really testing my, uh, my skills here. So thank you for that. I'm going to have some fun with flags later. I uh, really appreciate uh, appreciate you all being creative in your responses. So with this introduction, I, I would like to now turn it over uh, to our, our fearless panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Henry Louis. All right, good. Well, where I'm at, it's morning time. So I'll say good morning to everyone. Uh, it's we're the three of us are so excited to be here to, pre to be presenting to such an international audience on a topic that we find very interesting. And it's always nice to see that so many people across the, the globe are also interested 
in our topic. Uh, we'll start by doing some brief introductions of uh, the folks that will be speaking to you today, and then we'll get right into the meat of it. So uh, let me let me go ahead and go first. My name is Henry Louie. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at uh, Seattle University. We are a, a school, a, a private Jesuit university in Seattle. I also am the president and co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Kilowatts for Humanity, and we do electricity access primarily in uh, in and around Sub-Saharan Africa. I've also been on various IEEE committees and other leadership positions. So it's really exciting for me to talk to you uh, this morning. And joining me today, we have uh, Derek Terry. Derek, if you wanna unmute and uh, do a quick intro, that would be uh, delightful. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Derek Terry. Um, renewable energy specialist here for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. And I'm glad that, you know, all the wonderful people and literally across the world, you know, I see all the, the chat rooms and I'm, oh my gosh, I thought that we we're just limited to Arizona, but I guess it's all over. <laughs> Welcome. And we can dive into it here a little bit more when we, the discussion starts, but thank you and welcome. Great. And then uh, last, but certainly, last, but certainly not least, go ahead, Mohammed. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mohamed Baum. I'm a PhD candidate in industrial and system engineering at Virginia Tech. And uh, I joined E4C as a fellow last summer. Uh, and now I'm serving as a senior fellow. Uh, I'm always interested in finding intersection between engineering and uh, global development. And I'm really excited to be here with you. Okay, thank you, Mohamed and, and Derek. So to kind of center our, our discussion this, this morning, because what we're really talking about is is electricity access and um it is maybe surprising to some of you but certainly not all, all of you based upon the locations in the chat that uh many places in the world struggle with access to electricity and unfortunately the navajo nation on parts of it is is one of those locations um to paint the broad picture you know we we would describe uh, access to electricity or not having access to electricity as a form of energy poverty so energy poverty, a very simple definition is it's the lack of access to modern fuels. Now, globally, over 2 billion people, you know, rely on solid biomass or cooking and heating uh, for cooking and heating uh, things like crop residue, dung, charcoal or wood. That's how they heat their homes and uh, cook, uh, cook their food. A smaller amount, although sub certainly substantial, is uh, 733 million people don't have access to the electricity grid. Um, so that's approximately one out of every 10 people on the planet. And I should note that a far greater number than this uh, might have electricity going to their house, but it is unreliable or unaffordable. So 733 million is sort of the accepted lower bound uh, of that number. So where do people live that don't have access to electricity? Well, primarily it's in sub-Saharan Africa and villages like this, this is a, a village in Zambia, there's no power lines that make it to this village. Um, and so this is you know, endemic across the continent sub-Saharan Africa. So 70% of the people without access to electricity live in sub-Saharan Africa. Another 20% live in South Asia and 10% live in the rest of the world. And in my work, um, in my work history, typically you find that a lot of organizations, a lot of attention is focused on sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and not that rest of the world slice. Um, so it's important to not forget that even in places like the United States uh, and in a lot of our tribal communities, there are homes that don't have access to electricity. Uh, some estimates that I've seen in North America put the number of, of people without access to the grid to be somewhere north of 100,000 people, uh, which is a significant amount, maybe even up to 200,000, uh, depending on what you, what you count as access and what you don't. So our webinar today is primarily going to focus on this, this electricity access on the Navajo Nation and the challenges with that, but also the opportunities and, and what we've learned from off-grid electrification on the Navajo Nation. So let me just give you just a, a very brief background of the electricity access uh, situation. In the United States, rural electrification really took off 
in the 1930s with the intervention by the federal government that provided huge subsidies and loans to electrify rural areas. However, Navajo Nation, like many tribal communities, tribal lands in the United States, were um, overlooked by that uh, government intervention. So they didn't uh, they didn't receive the, the the benefits. Now, a reality of the situation is that to extend a power line, you know, usually costs somewhere between twenty to forty thousand dollars per mile. It's quite expensive. And on the Navajo Nation, some of the homes are so remote that they're maybe 40 miles from the nearest power line. So you can think about how much it would cost to extend the, the power line to that, that one home that is 40 miles away. It would be over a million dollars. And it makes sense then that you know it's it's not the highest priority or it's not you know really economically justifiable to, to spend a million dollars to connect one home. Uh, in addition, uh, Navajo Nation and um, you know, historically, they've been uh, they raise sheep and and goats and and horses and so forth, and so it's a pastoral community where they are used to having lots of land surrounding their homes with neighbors quite far away. So there's low population density. So you combine the the remoteness, the sparse population, you put those together, and it's a perfect recipe for low electrification. It would require substantial subsidies to connect all the homes. So as a result. There's about 10,000, maybe even 20,000 homes that aren't connected to the grid on the Navajo Nation. Uh, progress is, is being made, uh, but it's still a substantial gap. Um, and the Navajo Nation represents about you know, the least electrified of all the U.S. tribal reservations. So that's kind of a background. That's maybe why the situation is the way it is. And um, thankfully, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority has been making a lot of progress in, in changing the situation. So let me turn it over to Derek here to talk a little bit more about uh, NTUA. Let's see, Derek, you are muted. There you go. Okay, there you go. Um, good morning again, my name is Derek Terry the um, Renewable Energy Specialist here for um, Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. We have, um, our company is located here in uh, Fort Defiance, Arizona. Um, we are part of seven different, you know, districts with, throughout the whole Navajo Nation. So within our company, you know, I'll just do a quick rundown of what we do. And so within our company, um, what we cover is the electric distribution transmission throughout the whole Navajo Nation, as well as communication, whether it be broadband, fiber, or, you know, mobile, um, wireless, natural gas, water, wastewater, and, you know, photovoltaics. So that would be on-grid as well as off-grid. Um, and then our, the last is our off-grid systems. So one of the stats I want to add, and then the first slide here is estimated that 31% of homes lack complete plumbing, 28% lack kitchen facilities, 38% lack water services, 32% lack electricity, 86% you know, natural gas services, and finally 60% lack you know, regular landline telephone services. So in a composite, you know, we're the majority utility company that you know, oversees all these utilities throughout the whole Navajo Nation. So if you jump to the next slide, Henry. So the United the, 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 the Navajo Nation, you know, it covers four states. So we go into Colorado, Utah, Arizona, as well as New Mexico with a complete area of, you know, almost 18,000 square miles. So it's a significant amount of area. And a lot of it is still very, very remote. Um, the distances that our crews travel for outages, for installations of different utilities is substantial, you know, for you to go from one end of the Navajo Nation all the way to the next, you know, it could easily take you six to eight hours, depending on the route that you take. And so, hence the districts throughout the various areas of the Navajo Nation. And right in the middle there, um, if you can see the little area, that is the Hopi Reservation. So, Hopi is lucky that <laughs> the Navajo is surrounded by all of Hopi. So, but they're a good, they're a good neighbor to us and we're a good neighbor to them. So we help out on a lot of different projects. 
But in reality, you know, that's the size of the Navajo Nation as it is currently. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, with the with the inception of NTUA, um, one of the one of the programs that was thought about way early on, back in the, I want to say late 1980s, was um, the use of uh, solar panels and renewable energy. So, if you guys don't remember, you know, solar is relatively new. Um, there wasn't schools weren't doing it, um, community colleges weren't teaching it, um, but now. If you go out and you just walk a few feet, everybody's talking about renewable energy. Everybody's talking about sustainability, and that's the new the new go-to word. But I'm glad that the council here with the Navajo Nation, as well as the leaders here at NTUA, um, they had a little bit of forethought. So back in the late 1980s, I believe it was 1989, we had our first, you know, I believe it was a 200 watt you know, panel that we had. I think it was like four of them. So back in the day. They didn't have a 200 watt panel. I think they had like 60 watt or 40 watt panels. And then you just wired them all in a series with the, uh, maybe a couple of just regular off the line car batteries. So back then, you know, one of the things that we wanted to be was early on, we want to be an example for other native communities that are in our same type situation. And so why is that? Um, we got to stress the importance of energy efficiency and teach that to everybody within the household. Why? Because, you know, of the poverty level, um, low income, you know, unemployment rates, all time highs here on that one. So I, I did write down a couple of notes here. So for reference, you know, the unemployment rate right now is 48.5% here on that nation. So that, that is high, you know, super, super high. And then you have the, you have the average household income is right above eight thousand dollars, not per month, you know, not per, not biannually, but per year. Just imagine you trying to live on eight thousand dollars, you know, for one year with trying to support a family. Very difficult to do, much less trying to get electricity to your house. So um, it is a struggle here on Navajo. So we want to, so to help ease some of the struggles and difficulties of these families, we want to stress energy efficiency, energy sustainability. So why? So you can limit the amount of resources that come out of your pocket. So you buy a better appliance, you buy, you know, something that's gonna last you for a long time, although the upfront costs might be high, you make it last a little bit longer and let it ease your wallet just a little bit more. So next slide. So one of the solutions that we came up with was for the remote families, that won't ever have grid connection. And those are different reasons that, you know, that could happen. One of it is terrain. And secondly, is this the, the, the feasibility of it economically? It doesn't make sense to run 20 miles of, of hard line just for one family. You know, if you're putting in 10,000, 20,000, $30,000, maybe even a hundred, depending on the terrain, um, thousand dollars just to run for that one customer, that's just not feasible. Um, so what we end up doing is we give the family an option to run their home off of solar with the energy storage bank and um, give them power. Um, when it was first the inception of the program, the, the, the main direction of the solar unit was for safety. Because the amount of distances that you have to travel here on Navajo just to get to a health healthcare facility could be hours, easily hours especially if you don't have a vehicle. Uh, a lot of them, you have to leapfrog, you know, to call one family that might have a vehicle and then they take you and then their, family, their ride might not be very reliable. So they take you to point B and then you have to go from point B to C all the way until you finally get to the healthcare facility that you need. And a lot of these families that I have in the remote areas are elderly folks. So just imagine if, if you don't have no lights, if you're living off of a kerosene lamp or a, a propane lamp that you, you know, I don't know if you guys ever had the opportunity to, to pump that kerosene or that propane and you, you pump that little thing and you get light. Um, that's a very real situation right now. Kerosene is still used. You, you go to a gas station, you still have kerosene in the gas stations because people still use that. So the main importance of solar is light. 
we want to get light for these families. So at night, my elderly folks, they won't trip, they won't fall, they won't hurt themselves. And that's the reason that was the main push of the original solar units. As years went on, you know, the solar got more efficient, batteries got more reliable, um, the knowledge base grew. So like I was saying, you wouldn't hear anything about solar, you know, years down the road, but now you can't, now you go to community college, now you go to university, now you have degrees in this stuff. So with that new knowledge becomes the advancement in the technology of the systems. So as a result, if you look at the screen now, these are our new systems, our 3000 watt systems. They have the ability to run a water pump to run their cistern system, their septic heat. You know, they have a, the ability to run an 18 cubic foot refrigerator. And not only that, but you don't have, you know, the reliability of the batteries a little bit better. So that, you know, the system has three days of autonomy. So during our long storms, so you, if you don't believe it, Arizona, we experience all four seasons. Henry can attest to that. We, he just came to a three-day storm out of Seattle. He never knew. And then this was this a week and a half, two weeks ago. So we, we experienced the full gamut. You know, we've experienced 100-degree weather. And then we experienced the minus 10-degree weather. So the systems are definitely tested here in Arizona. So we have our trials and tribulations with them. Um, we're almost like a test bed in certain times. Um, we, we definitely run these systems all the way through and we run them to the ground sometimes. And so with the whole point of having to try to get these family reliable electricity. So right now, currently within our program, um, it has 500 on here, but we just added another 100. So we're about 600 systems that we have out in the field right now for these families. And so with the seven districts across the Navajo Nation with three to four, you know, trained personnel, they have the ability to go out and touch these systems if needed in the event of an outage. So they go out, they service them, they maintain them, and they keep them running. So three days of autonomy, um, we treat them like a regular outage. So if we have an issue with the systems, it's not up to the customer to service these things, it's up to us in T-Way. If the battery goes out, if the panel gets damaged, if the inverter goes out, um, anything, anything with the system in T-Way takes care of that cost. So that's a benefit to the customer because the customer, again, you go back to the average monthly income of $8,000. There's no way, even if they save, they're gonna replace a battery bank at $7,000. It's going to take them 15, 20 years to even try to get up to that point. So to relieve the stress of that family in two way, you know, picks up the cost for that. So it can be substantial. So there's many things that go in place. You got education to the family, you got education to our workers that go online to try to keep the systems up and running and reliable. Um, so it is a big endeavor and a big um, job that we do here for MTA for these families as well as the solar units to keep them running. So next slide. And so the off-grid system themselves, you know, we got 300 of the, of the solar. So these are the different um, inverter types that we're calling out. So based a 300 watt system, 300 watt or 3000 watt, I'm sorry, 3000 watt system, 300 are the solar inverter main system, and then you got the 150 outback radian series systems. So two different systems and they're both providing power to our off-grid systems. And so with the help of Henry, all these systems are tied to a, um, a Samsara um, monitoring system. Like, um, Henry can probably talk about a little bit more of, of the specifics mm -hmm. on the Samsara, but all of them, you know, they all company back to um, one database and Henry has access to that. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so as uh, as Derek uh, said, these are the systems that we're going to be considering in, in our case study. Uh, in fact, we're looking specifically at the at 150 of the 300 solar. The 150 that we're looking at were installed a, a couple of years ago. The the additional ones have been installed more been installed more recently. Um, here's just some more pictures. It's a 3.8 
<laughs> KW system, it's bifacial, so the array actually has cells on the, the back of it to catch some reflected irradiance. And here's the uh, the batteries there, uh, 16 of them. They're uh, gel lead acid batteries. Um, each, each battery is about 200 amp hours a pop. Um, the system schematic looks something like this. Uh, the, there's two, the array is broken into two subarrays. We have our battery bank here, eight KW inverter. Now, as Derek said, we are collecting lots and lots of data from this gigabytes worth at this point. Uh, but the, the data that we're really going to focus on for most of this talk is here. It's the data going to the homes. It's, excuse me, it's the power going to the homes. So one of the research questions that we're asking is, well, how much power do people use uh, from these systems? Because really it's important to understand that, to understand should the systems uh, be larger or smaller, uh, how reliable are they, et cetera. So we're really going to focus on how people use the electricity from these systems. Uh, we have an opportunity to look at 150 of them um, for multiple years at this point, and it's really a study like no other. The amount of data that we're getting is, is truly amazing, and NTUA had some good force, force uh, thought into uh, equipping them with these in, these data acquisition systems. So it's, it's an amazing opportunity to, to learn what's going on. Uh, the data is sampled sometimes multiple times a minute, but basically what we do is we, we sample the, the uh, power output and we convert it to 10 minute averages and then we do our analysis. And the analyses that I'm going to talk about basically consider January 1st to the end of December 2022, so a two year period. Some of the analyses go all the way up to March, uh, however. So let's jump right into it then. Um, Let's look at the energy consumption characteristics. Well, one of the first things that you'll note when you start looking through the data is that there's a diversity in the consumption. Uh, not all the homes, although they all have the same system, all are located on the Navajo Nation, they don't all have the same daily pattern. Uh, what you see here are just four examples of daily electrical energy use. Some of the homes exhibit wide variety, uh, so they might, have days where they're they're fairly low, some days where they they're fairly high consumption. Some are fairly consistent, uh, same day to day day energy use. Some have strong seasonal patterns. Some have something happened to the home and and their consumption either decreased or maybe it increased. But the overall takeaway here is that there's just not one profile. There's just not one typical consumption characteristic. Um, which means that we have to be a little more nuanced in our approach, right? There, there's a variety of, of consumption patterns, not unlike what you would find really anywhere else in the world. So one of the things that we're really interested in is how has consumption changed on the longer term? So what we did is we looked at the con total consumption and took the average of it of all the homes per month from inception. So this goes all the way up to about March of this year. And, you know, we do notice a couple of, of uh, attributes here, right? We notice that there is a, a seasonal profile here that tends to peak in the summer. Uh, this is a, interesting. Uh, there may be a couple of reasons why for this. Uh, one is that there could be some electricity that's used for cooling. Uh, we also think that there it could be attributed to work and school patterns, which have a seasonality to it. People, children might be, uh, or adults might be home during the summer. More people in the home usually means more electricity uses. Uh, it also could be related to the availability of the energy. Sunnier in the summer, so maybe people know that and they can consume more, more energy. One of the other things that we note is that there's actually from 2021 to 2022 a decrease in, in energy consumption. And this is a little atypical from maybe your experience in Sub-Saharan Africa, where generally we see growth. Um, there could be some reasons for that. One is that in 2021, the Navajo Nation very much had COVID restrictions uh, applied to it. So people were working from home. Uh, they stayed at home a lot more in 2021 than 2022. So as more people left the home in 2022, maybe that had to do a, a decrease. Uh, maybe that was why the consumption decreased. Uh, it's also possible that the components made uh, degraded from year, you know, 2021 to 2022, making less energy available. 
So we're doing uh, some surveys and we're looking into this in more detail, but right now this is what the data is, is showing is that there's a, a, a decrease. Now, if we drill down, instead of looking at overall averages of all the homes, if we look at how much energy each home consumed on a particular day, and we plot the histogram of it, we get something that looks like this. So on the AC side, the average consumption was 3.58 kilowatt hours per day. But you can see from this distribution, there's a wide variety of that. Not every home consumed 3.58. Right. There was a wide distribution. Some consumed multiple times that, some consumed far less than that. Um, by the way, 3.5 kilowatt hours a day is, is actually quite low. If you look at, say, New Mexico, their average for grid connected homes, it's more like 20 to 24 kilowatt hours per day. So this is still providing access to electricity, but it's not replicating the grid. Um, and I think that's an important aspect. Now, if we look on the DC side of the system, the DC side of the inverter, uh, the consumption is probably about five kilowatt hours a day. Uh, this is based on uh, estimated inverter losses. So that, that jump from 3.58 to five has to do with the inverters, you know, its internal fans turning on, it's, it's keeping its own lights on, et cetera. Uh, and that is actually more energy, that, that difference, that about 1.5, kilowatt hours is about 15 to 20 percent of the homes actually consume less than that on the AC side. So it can be significant. And I know as a as a, a result of that, that understanding, uh, NTUA is now installing systems with much smaller inverters to try to reduce those standby losses because eight kilowatts of consumption very rarely ever occurred. So this is what it looks like in, in form of a in the form of a histogram. If we wanted to look at it in a slightly different way, um, this is looking at the, uh, this is a, an empirical inverse uh, a cumulative distribution function where we can see the percentiles or quantiles uh, and how much they consumed. So as an example, if we look at the 50th percentile, um, that's the median. So half the homes, essentially consumed more than 3.14 kilowatt hours a day, half consumed less. On either of the extremes, if we jump up to the 95th percentile, you know, then we get to 6.77 kilowatt hours a day. So 95% of the homes consumed no more than this. Understanding this curve is important in determining what's an appropriate size for your system. Generally speaking, we don't size around the maximum. We would just, you know, design around maybe the 95th or 97th percentile because we'll see to meet the needs of everyone, you end up with a very, very large system. Yeah, so here, if you want to, uh, as a little guide, this is how you would interpret that. The 50th percentile, you draw a line straight up and you would go to the left to see the consumption. Um, now, homes consumed... Uh, generally had a wide variety in their daily consumption. So even within a home, there was a variety in consumption. Some homes were a little more consistent than others. Some exhibited a wide variety. So if you look at their average value, which is this dashed red line, some homes uh, stayed you know, within a multiple of it. Some, it was three or four or five times their average that they consumed on Sundays. So this could be days where maybe they had company over days at work was extremely hot or extremely cold, whatever the reason. And so this also, this wide variety that, that some of the homes ex, um, exhibited makes it challenging to design the battery bank um, to figure out how many days of autonomy is actually provided. Um, and, and it's important characteristic to look at on a per home basis, right? It's the variation that happened. Now, just to provide uh, a, a, some a specific examples. Here are 25 homes and the box plot of their energy use. So what we see here is that little green horizontal line. That's the median daily consumption for that home. And then within the box, it's the 25th and 75th percentile. So it gives you an idea of the range that typically uh, were exhibited by homes. You can see for most homes, the consumption is less than five kilowatt hours a day, although there are some that, that is a bit higher. And uh, some have small ranges, some have large ranges. One of the most important things to note here, if any of you are researchers that are trying to model off-grid consumption, is that the distributions aren't normal. They're not 
Gaussian distribution. So if you make that assumption that the day-to-day -day consumption follows a normal distribution, um, that's really not that accurate. These are, these are uh, they don't follow any parametric distribution that I'm aware of, although maybe a future research task could be modeling distribution functions to fit, fit these. So they all exhibit sort of a skewness in the positive direction with outliers um, on, on the positive side. Very briefly, let me talk about, about some load profiles. Uh, so this is some work that uh, Scott O'Shea, who I think is in the audience, worked on and it looked at consuming like when when that energy is consumed over the course of the day and generally we see that um there in the late evening consumption tends to be quite low and then it rises in the morning this is probably when people are getting ready for the day we kind of plateau throughout the day maybe even have a little dip this could be refrigerator load or you know there might be some people home with some appliances on but then we have a peak in the evening, maybe when people get back from work or whatever they were doing during the day. So it's kind of an evening peaking load, and then it decreases. The evening peaking load makes it challenging for solar. We generally want to have a, a daily, you know, a daytime peaking load. So it's more coincident with the, when the sun uh, is uh, producing energy. <clears throat> so this does pose a little bit of a challenge then to designing the systems. We also looked at how it varied from one season to the next, and you can see that it's fairly consistent with most seasons, sort of in the the uh, the spring and summer months, um, you, you have more load that occurs during the day, but more or less, you see that two peaks that uh, generally happen. So what does this all tell us in terms of design? Well, we looked at how the PV arrays are sized based upon the load that was actually recorded. Um, so the first thing that we we did in, in this research was to figure out how much energy could be ex we could expect these PV panels to produce. And to do that, we used a simple formulation. I don't think I'm going to go into it in detail, but essentially you can estimate the energy that, that can be produced by PV array based upon the average insulation of the area, accounting for the tilt and the, the latitude and longitude and the losses. And we picked 4.2, excuse me, 4.5 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. That's the January average insulation for the the, uh, the homes that have the solar systems. And then from that, we said, well, we need to apply an array to load ratio of about 1.3 because you have to oversize to some degree, make up for um, uh, times when the consumption is a lot higher or the battery charging profile doesn't let you consume as much energy as, as could be produced. So when we do that, we can take the two equations and we can put them together. And you come up with the result that for every one kilowatt hour of DC side load requires three, 385 uh, watts of PV uh, capacity. So based on those assumptions, for every kilowatt hour of DC side load, that's how much capacity you would need to serve it. And so what we did is we looked at the distribution then of DC side load and figured out how large of a PV array we would have needed. Now, this is retro. I mean, we're looking, we have the benefit of having this data. So we're looking back. Um, we didn't have this data, of course, during the design phase. But what it tells us is that because the consumption is, is fairly low, the we could serve about 50% of the homes with a 1.7 kW array. Now, remember that the arrays themselves are somewhere around here, you know, 3.8 kW. So in some cases, in fact, many cases, the PV array could be made a lot smaller and uh, and still provide the homes, but it wouldn't be able to provide enough energy for all the homes, right? Um, but uh, it, it, it does suggest that an approach maybe in the future would be would be to offer maybe smaller arrays for, uh, you know, maybe half the homes and, and then the other half could get these larger arrays and that could be a way of saving money if interested. A similar approach would be to look at the battery bank sizing where we look at the days of autonomy and we do some calculations based upon that. And I think I'll, I'll go through this a little bit fast, but we make some assumptions on how the batteries are gonna behave over time uh, how deeply they'll be discharged and what their charging efficiency would be. And based upon these reasonable assumptions, for, for every kilowatt hour of DC side load, you need about six kilowatt hours of battery size. 
So we again can look at the actual DC size load, DC side load, and see how large of a battery we would need to meet it, to meet three days of autonomy. And what we see is that the existing battery banks provide three days of autonomy for about 75% of the systems. So you might say, well, the target was three days of autonomy. This seems to, you know, you're only doing that for, for three out of four homes. So maybe the design was off. But to really look at what it would take to, to provide three days autonomy for all systems, it would require more than doubling the battery bank capacity, uh, which would result in gigantic battery banks. So here we're highlighting the trade-off, right? You know, if you're going to have one design that you stick with, where on this curve, where on this table do you want to be? And I would argue that meeting 75% of the homes with three days of autonomy is probably a, a good trade-off. The more homes that you serve, the larger the battery bank you need to have for each home. So let me just point out a few things um, before we talk about future work. Uh, what we've kind of shown in this design case study of, of looking, having the benefit of having now historical data shows uh, a few things. First of all, if you didn't have the data, estimating the size of the load and the size of your components is very difficult, especially in contexts where you know there's not a lot of literature. Uh, I'll also point out the NTUA, when they rolled these systems out, were less concerned about capital costs and more concerned about getting them rolled out quickly and having sort of a one size fits all for, for just efficiency on their end. And then also, uh, this, as Derek pointed out, the service costs are high. Getting out to some of these areas can take hours. So you'd rather have maybe your PV array larger than it needed to be if that meant one fewer trip that you had to take a year. Um, so we shouldn't ignore the maintenance and service costs. Now that we're just sort of scratching the surface on the analysis that we can do here. Um, we just like what I presented was just about electricity use. Mohammed is going to briefly talk about some of the feature analyses that we're looking at. Uh, so go ahead, Mohammed. Thank you, Henry. So as if, uh, our future analysis will include <coughs> analyzing battery voltage profiles in order to give us insight about the reliability of the system. Uh, as you can see here uh, in the figure, it provides a typical voltage profile. Uh, so little after sun uh, after sunrise there is enough uh, solar power for the batteries to recharge which is evident by the battery voltage increasing rapidly and this is called the bulk charging uh, stage and once the battery voltage increases to predefined set points as you can see up there it's called the absorption voltage it's usually for between 45 46 to 50 voltage depending on the, on the temperature here it's uh, above that uh, then the charge controller regulates the battery voltage as uh, so it doesn't damage the battery by over over voltage and this is called the absorption uh, stage which can be short as a few minutes to long the longer uh, hour several hours for example and when the battery is fully battery is fully charged it transmission uh, to float stage and the battery is maintained at a lower voltage uh, as you can see, lasting from uh, about 11 a.m. in this graph to 4 p.m. And this typically, uh, this profile just shows a, a typical behavior. It doesn't happen always exactly like this one, but this is a typical behavior showing uh, over the year uh, in, the, in multiple systems. So we'll be trying to investigate multiple, multiple systems, sample from systems that we have over the year, and see how the behavior is showing in order to give us insight uh, of the reliability of the system. This next slide shows an example of uh, uh, time series analysis for the battery. Uh, uh, this is 10 days, it's showing 10 days in January. You can see most of the days where the absorption uh, stage uh, reached. However, there are some, some days uh, uh, didn't, it didn't reach the absorption, uh, or sometimes it's a different times happen. For example, in January 1st, the absorption stage was only reached late in the afternoon. This could mean that the battery was never fully uh, recharged on that day. So we are now investigating uh, if the timing of wind absorption stage is reached and how often it's reached it, and also which will give us a, an insight about the reliability of the system. Next slide, please. This graph shows the histogram for the voltage. 
as we can see here in the system, uh, spins significant amount of the time at uh, around absorption voltage. So between 40 and uh, 56 volt. Uh, so this, this indicates a higher reliability of the system. Uh, this graph shows the an example of the time at which the absorption stage uh, is first reach for four different units. Some get recharged earlier in the day, which again would suggest that the batteries are being fully recharged. Uh, so now we are at this stage of analysis. We will try to get uh, solicit at what time exactly the battery reached to uh, to the recharge uh, to the fully absorption over the year for multiple systems. And we'll compare and see uh, the reliability of the system uh, across the year. So this is a type of analysis that you can do if you have uh, such data for off-grid system. Uh, and hopefully we'll get uh, more insight from the result we have in this future result research. Yeah, thank you, Mohammed. So that's some work that Mohammed worked on as a E4C uh, fellow, and we're, we're continuing. Uh, on it. So to, to, to conclude this this case study, we actually looked at over 100 million uh, data points to, to do this analysis. Uh, the consumption, average daily consumption on the AC side was 3.58 kilowatt hours uh, per day, which is far lower than grid connected homes in the area, but also about an order of magnitude higher than what you often see in sub-Saharan Africa. So it highlights sort of the difference that context makes. Not all homes that are powered by off-grid systems use that electricity in, in the same way. There's a wide variety of consumption characteristics that we saw. Uh, we saw that, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, probably the PV and in inverter sizes could be reduced somewhat and still meet that, that demand, um, or a segmented approach could be used. Um, the battery bank, though, seemed to offer the, the uh, desired days of autonomy for a reasonable number of, of the homes. Um, as Muhammad talked about for next steps, we're going to look at really the battery bank voltage and what that can tell us. We'll be also looking at load profiles in more detail. Uh, we're doing some surveys to figure out and explain some of the characteristics of uh, the consumption that, that we've seen. We're deploying some data acquisition systems to look at sunlight and, and to try to figure out how well the PV panels are performing. And uh, we'll also be looking at reliability. Um, this work was funded by the National Science Foundation. There is another partner that we have, Navajo Technical University, that's uh, been very much involved in this project, although none of the, their faculty are, are presenting today, as well as uh, several other in individuals uh, that have contributed to this work in one, one way or another. If you're, very, if you're interested in this, uh, this is a uh, this top citation um, for uh, energy for sustainable development. Actually, it was just published, so it's not under revision anymore, um, is, is available and uh, it contains all the details. So with that, I think we're ready for, for Q&A. Here are our contact informations and uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Henry. Uh, and a number of questions have already come in. I'm gonna let you keep sharing your screen just in case you wanna reference any slides and in, in answering the questions that have already come in. Um, and I welcome uh, our listeners to go ahead and put questions into the Q&A so we can keep track of them. So a uh, number of questions came in specifically for you, Derek, uh, related to uh, the NTUA and um, more of the administration in terms of who finances the NTUA, um, what the revenue model is. Um, if you can speak to that briefly, please. Okay. Um, basically, Everything in our area, we work off of the rural utility services. So it's a it's a department that's that's located under the um, the USDA, so United States Department of Agriculture. So they they luckily for us that we qualify for low interest long term loans, and so that gives us the ability to you know finance a lot of these projects that are happening. Uh, recently, with the um, with the administration that, as it is, you know, with with the pandemic that we, you know, just went through, are going through um, with COVID, they had released on um, the CARES funding. So the, the Affordability Act, I believe, was the second one. So it was the ARPA. So you got the CARES Act and you got the ARPA. So it was a significant amount of money that was channeled through the um, through the administration here in the United States. So 
we got quite a bit of money that um, would help us with COVID relief. And as a result, we were able to direct that towards a lot of the families and use the funding to purchase a lot of these solar units for, you know, through the CARES Act as well as the ARPA, so which is um, the American Relocation um, Act, I believe it is. I, I, don't, I don't remember what the acronym, acronym stood for, but those are two significant, you know, funding vehicles that we were able to use. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much for providing some of that insight. Um, we also have some very specific uh, uh, system design questions, um, probably more for Henry and Mohammed. Uh, considering the huge variation in load profiles, have you explored the possibility of designing standalone systems for some households, um, the outliers in particular, instead of fully interconnecting the system? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> good good question. Uh, you know, to be clear, this all of these systems are are off grid, and none of them are interconnected with with any other um, any other system. So they're all standalone. Um, I think it's really interesting to look at the outliers um, because those are the, the the homes that are consuming lots of energy, which you usually want, right? If you're going to install a solar system, you want people to consume a lot of energy. Uh, unfortunately, just looking at the data alone doesn't tell us what these people are using it on, what you know, what conditions they're in, what demographics slice they are. We're going to be looking into that with some of the surveys that we do. But the, the very brief exercise that we went through in this webinar about, well, once you have the data, you can use that to figure out how big of a, a system you would need. It does uncover the fact that, that there are some homes that are really out there on the tail. And if you design all the systems to meet the needs of that that one home that consumes the most, you actually end up with very, very large systems that for, quite frankly would be a waste of money and, and just sort of impractical mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to, to install. So understanding that distribution of, of consumption, I think is really important if you were to try to have a segmented approach, right? If you didn't want to do a one size fits all, if you wanted to come up with two options or three options, understanding where on the curve each of those uh, options would, uh, would serve is, is quite important. That's, that's excellent. And there's a lot of questions about the batteries now, zeroing in on that. Um, what is the lifespan of the batteries, uh, most especially maintenance, since it's uh, peculiar that most of the areas where these batteries are used are low-income areas, and also, as in most cases, these batteries are not produced, in, for example, in this instance, from the question in Sub-Saharan Africa. Derek, do you want to I comment? can start. I yeah. can start and then you can follow up on the specifics, Henry. Um, so, so the batteries, you know, that we contacted or that we contracted with has a, have a, have a warranty lifespan of five years. Mm -hmm. And so, and these are maintenance free batteries. Um, I believe they're AGM batteries, so aug augmented glass mat batteries. Um, so what the whole point of the reason why we want them is to kind of ease the amount of time that we have our crews to get on site with them. Mm -hmm. So before we had these batteries, we had the lead acid batteries. So the flooded lead acid batteries. So for you all that are, that, that are familiar with these type of batteries, you have to refill them with distilled water. And so and that takes a lot of time. Then there has to have a, um, established crew on site and with a reliable vehicle to constantly be out every three months to refill these batteries. Mm -hmm. So with the added amount of units that we had on, we just we just couldn't do that. So we made the change for maintenance-free battery, which would limit the amount of time that we go out and service these units. So currently what we have in the systems are the are the maintenance-free battery, AGM batteries, as well as a set of lithium batteries. So um, Henry can probably talk a little bit more on the specifics and you know talk about the the report. So go ahead, Henry. Yeah, sure. So uh, as Derek said, the the batteries that we looked at here are you know I think they're gel, uh, not not just AGM uh, gel batteries. Uh, there's another set of units that use lithium ion batteries. Uh, the ones here are, are gel. The uh, you know, one thing you have to understand with battery life is usually manufacturers uh, do tests in very controlled conditions with constant current and, you know, room temperature. And as Derek talked about, uh, 
there's four seasons <laughs> where, where these are exposed to, and they're not in any sort of temperature controlled environment. So they're exposed to, to hot temperatures, cold temperatures. I'm sure that affects um, and will affect their performance and, and overall lifespan. So, you know, the, the kind of the jury is still out on how, how, how long they're going to last um, and, and how they're going to be performing. It, it's certainly a consideration if anyone else is, is thinking about doing a similar project is to think about battery, the battery selection and, and really understand uh, how batteries are, are um, rated. And it's usually not for environments that aren't temperature controlled where they can get snowed on, they can get heated up pretty, you know, pretty high temperature as well. Yeah, it looks like this, there's a lot of questions about just operation of various batteries experiences that people are, are sharing regarding uh, struggles to recharge the bank sufficiently to maintain health. So uh, it's definitely uh, a common issue here. Uh, I am going to, I can tell the audience that we have a lot of questions and I, I suspect we're not going to be able to answer all of them on go. We I do want to uh, see if our, our speakers will be kind enough to perhaps do a follow up and addressing some of these questions offline. But there are two questions have come in that are related to each other in terms of uh, designing other systems based on these learnings. So the specific question here is what tools and resources would you recommend in sizing a system without a data set like this? And are there any metrics that you didn't measure that would have benefited you greatly? Oh, wonderful question. So, you know, if you are don't have the benefit of historical data, um, really the kind of the state of the, the art is to do surveys or try to do a bottom up approach where if you have some control over the number of appliances that are out there, you know, you you estimate how many appliances of which power rating um, there's going to be how long they're going to be used and you build the load profile up like that there are several um universities that have developed tools that will help you come up with a you know realistic ish profile uh but really having historical data is where it's at i mean you, you there are some data sets that are out there if you look at our paper uh we we do provide i i think enough of the the statistical characteristics to get you started, uh, but it's extremely hard to do without historical data. If you do do the survey approach where you ask the potential users what appliances you might have, how long are you going to use it, take any response that you get with a grain of salt. Uh, we've done other research where you know we've shown the survey methods to be off by like 300% where people tend to overestimate. In particular, the tariff structure also affects how much people will consume, especially in extremely low income settings. Uh, people might, when you survey them, might say they're going to use all this electricity, um, but then they get the bill for it in practice and they say, well, you know what, we actually can't afford to use that much. And so you, you might be extremely developed, uh, extremely disappointed. I will point out that a couple of years ago, I did do a webinar series for Engineering for Change. And in one of those modules, we did talk about load estimation and, and how to incorporate that. Uh, the tools that you can use to design the system once you have an idea of the load, I mean, there's many out there. Personally, myself and my nonprofit, we rely on on Homer, uh, which is a, a really good tool. Again, to make it to, to get valuable information from Homer, you have to put in good information, and that includes the load. Um, I think there was a second part of the question about what data do we wish we we had measured. I think having some sunlight data, the uh, radiance data, pyranometer installed with some of the solar arrays would be really helpful for letting us understand how the solar arrays are, are performing. Uh, this is something that we're retroactively putting out in some of the units. In fact, Navajo Technical University is working on that design and installation. Um, they're leading that effort. So we'll be putting some of those out there. Uh, but that's probably the one piece that I wish we had. That's excellent. And I think we're taking our last question. And this is one that I think there's also a little bit of a recurring theme in the questions around, which was, uh, can you describe the monitoring system a little bit more? How does the data get transmitted to the folks doing the monitoring? And there is just generally interest in understanding data flows uh, for the systems. Yeah, so uh... NTUA, when they when they put out their uh, request for proposals, specified that the solutions had to have data data uh, acquisition capability. So 
the vendor that they went with uses Samsara, and uh, Samsara is you know an industrial uh, data acquisition company. I mean, this is what they do, and so they installed it. I believe it's all they collect data, they sample the data. I believe it's uh, pushed out through the cell network uh, to just the cloud, essentially. And um, we're able to access it through just an API. So I re really just have a Python script that we run every so often that downloads the data. And it ends up being, there's about 50 fields of data that it, it that come from each unit, sometimes mul multiple times a minute for hundreds of units. It ends up being a tremendous amount of data that needs to be ingested and, and processed. But uh, I, I don't, I, I think it's been, uh, really a highlight of this work <laughs> is being able to get such high quality data. It's really remarkable and amazing because some of these locations are really, really remote. I mean, really remote. Indeed. Um, well, uh, we have arrived at the end of our time together. I apologize. We have something like 20 more questions <laughs> that went unanswered uh, because this topic is obviously of tremendous interest to our audience and relevance. Uh, globally. Um, so I, I want to thank all of our speakers today, Mohammed, Henry, Derek. It's been such a pleasure uh, learning more about this particular uh, case study and, and hearing the necessary details uh, about how your work has advanced uh, accessibility and, and how we'll help others uh, design similar systems. So uh, we will try to get to some of the questions that went unanswered. Uh, please do follow us on E4C to hear more about where you can uh, see some of these questions addressed and for snippets of this particular webinar. And we've shared the link to the webinar series that Henry generously uh, provided previously that includes a lot of detailed guidance on, on how to do load estimation amongst other topics. With that, I, I want to wish all of you a good morning, a good evening, or good afternoon. We're looking forward to seeing you on another webinar soon. And thank you all so much for your attention, your time, and your thoughtful questions today. It's been a fantastic conversation. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Take care.